Hi there. Today I'm going to tell you about five horrifying experiments that the government tried to hide from history, and you won't believe they actually happened. First, the poison experiments. In the mid-20th century, in the shadow of the Cold War, the Soviet Union conducted one of the darkest and most terrifying experimental programs in modern history. The center of these experiments was a top-secret complex, called Laboratory 1, later renamed Laboratory 12. The person in charge and main director of the experiments was none other than Grigory Marinovsky, a biochemist and simultaneously an officer of the NKVD intelligence agency. The experiments mainly took place at Gulag concentration camps, scattered across Soviet territory. Looking at a map, one could see red dots, places where thousands of political prisoners were detained and forced to perform hard labor regardless of gender. They had no idea they would become living test subjects for a series of deadly poisons. During the period from 1921 to 1991, many mysterious deaths occurred after each meal. Symptoms began with nausea, difficulty breathing, paralysis of limbs, and then mass deaths. Later investigations showed these deaths were directly related to Marinovsky's experiments. He had secretly added extremely powerful poisons like ricin, cyanide, curare, digitoxin, and a prisoner's food to study reactions. The ultimate goal of the experiments was to find a perfect poison, colorless, odorless, tasteless, and especially leaving no trace after the victim's death. After many years of research, they created a substance called C2. When infected, the victim would feel strangely relaxed, then the body would gradually contract and die within 15 minutes, without leaving any clear clues. Not stopping at experiments, the Soviet Union used these poisons in real assassinations. In 1947, Bishop Theodore Romja was hit by a Red Army truck. When the accident didn't kill him, a nurse planted by the Soviets injected curare, causing his death in the hospital. In 1978, journalist Georgi Markov felt a sharp pain in his leg while waiting for a bus in London. A stranger had used an umbrella containing a small bullet with ricin attached to poison him. Four days later, he died. In 2018, double agent Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia were found unconscious on a park bench in England. Investigations showed they were poisoned with Novichok, an extremely powerful nerve agent that could cause death with just a tiny amount. A perfume bottle left in a nearby trash can was identified as the Novichok container. All these assassinations were related to the Soviet Union's chemical weapons arsenal. And most of the poisons were developed from Grigory Marinovsky's very experiments. Though many files have been destroyed, that silent crime still haunts humanity to this day. Second, the experiment bringing the dead back to life. In 1932 in the United States, there was a doctor named Robert Cornish. He was far from ordinary. He was a scientific genius who had earned his PhD at just 22 years old. But that brilliance came with something else, an obsession with defeating death. One day, he came up with a crazy idea, bringing the dead back to life. And he decided to turn this idea into a real experiment. The device he created looked like a giant seesaw, but on it wasn't a child, but a human corpse. He injected into this body a special drug mixture designed to thin the blood. Next, he pumped oxygen into the corpse and then violently rocked the seesaw, hoping blood would circulate again. But after many attempts, not a single corpse came back to life. Robert failed. However, he didn't stop. He moved on to a more feasible target, dogs. He brought home five dogs and performed the same revival procedure. Surprisingly, two of them showed responses. They came back to life, but in extremely terrible condition blind, unconscious, unable to perceive anything, and died shortly after. Still, Robert considered this an initial success. His belief was strengthened to the point where he wanted to try again on humans. But not just anyone could be chosen as a test subject. He needed a human corpse that had just died. Very fortunately, or very horrifyingly, an opportunity came in 1945. A girl named Thora Chamberlain went missing after school. Through investigation, police discovered the perpetrator was Thomas the man who had picked her up that day. Thomas was sentenced to death by gas chamber. But before the sentence was carried out, Robert Cornish contacted the police to request Thomas's body after execution to serve his revival experiment. However, this raised an extremely sensitive issue. If Thomas were successfully revived, legally speaking, he would have already been executed once. That meant he couldn't be executed a second time. And if so, he could be set free. The police were concerned and refused Robert's request. Eventually, Robert's human revival project also came to a close, but he still hadn't given up his passion. He appeared in a film called Life Returns, where he played himself. 
a doctor obsessed with reviving humans and dogs. The film caused fierce controversy because it raised ethical questions. Should humans interfere with natural law? Is revival a miracle or an insult to death? Though the experiment failed, Robert Cornish's name is forever mentioned. His story laid the foundation for a series of unanswered questions about life and death, about science. Third, candy and tooth decay, the Vipholm experiment. In 1945, in a peaceful town in Sweden called Lund, there existed a hospital that looked like any other medical facility from the outside. But inside was where a horrifying experiment took place that is still condemned ethically to this day. Vipholm Hospital was a place that received and cared for people with severe intellectual disabilities. Most patients here had IQ scores below 70, with virtually no ability to think logically, analyze, or perceive like normal people. They lived quietly in closed rooms, not knowing that their bodies were about to become tools for researchers to answer a simple question. Does candy cause tooth decay? A group of scientists was sent to the hospital to begin the experiment. They selected 660 patients and secretly divided them into many small groups. Between main meals, these people would be given chocolate, caramel candy, and hard butter candy, all containing very high amounts of sugar. The candy eating occurred regularly every day for many months straight, without a single patient being asked for their opinion or understanding what was happening. The results quickly became apparent. Almost all participating patients began showing symptoms of tooth decay, from mild to severe. Among them, 50 people had nearly their entire set of teeth ruined, rotten, blackened teeth falling out everywhere. Why choose mental patients as subjects? The cruel answer, because they couldn't resist. The researchers believed they didn't need consent from people who couldn't make decisions. But more tellingly, the Swedish government and candy manufacturers had funded this experiment, hoping the results would deny sugar's role in causing tooth decay. Ironically, the very data collected confirmed the opposite, sugar was the main cause. Bacteria in the mouth, when encountering sugar, would create acid, corroding tooth enamel and causing decay. This left authorities embarrassed, while candy companies were furious. Although the results of the Vipolm experiment contributed importantly to understanding the causes of tooth decay and changing prevention methods. Later, the price those 660 patients had to pay was undeniable. No one asked their permission, no one protected them. And to this day, this remains a stain in Swedish medical history. Evidence of the painful question, is knowledge worth it when the price is human dignity? Fourth, the Cannibal Island Nazino tragedy. In the spring of 1933, Soviet authorities under Stalin decided to clean major cities of homeless people, petty criminals, and anyone deemed reactionary. They arrested tens of thousands of people without trial, without warning, then pushed them onto trains bound for Siberia. One destination was Nazino Island, a small island in the middle of the Ob River, completely wild, with no houses, no food, no preparation. Over 6,000 people were dumped on this island in terrible condition. They were only given a little raw wheat flour. No stove, no pot, not even a spoon. Drinking water came from the river. Many died within just a few days from cold, hunger, or being shot by guards for trying to swim away. But that wasn't the worst part. When hunger reached its extreme, the survivors began eating the flesh of the dead. Then later, they killed people to eat them. Witnesses recounted scenes of people chopping off a living girl's leg, keeping her alive to eat gradually, because the rest would spoil quickly. The army was sent after about 13 weeks to clean up. By then, only about 2,000 people survived, most in severe exhaustion. The rest, cannibalized, starved to death, or killed. Soviet authorities kept silent about this event for decades. It wasn't until the 1980s that documents were declassified. To this day, locals still call Nazino the Cannibal Island. A social experiment? Carelessness in policy? Or a disguised death camp? Whatever it was, it makes you shudder to think about how easily humans can be discarded. Fifth, the reign of death, Operation Sea Spray USA. Can you believe it that on a beautiful morning in 1950, the US government sprayed bacteria over a peaceful city just to see what would happen? That's not a conspiracy theory. That was Operation Sea Spray, one of the secret biological weapons testing programs conducted in San Francisco. In September of that year, the US Navy had a destroyer sail offshore and began spraying billions of Sriracha marcescens and Bacillus globigii bacteria, two types of bacteria considered harmless, into the air. Within days, the entire city of San Francisco, with over 800,000 people, had unknowingly inhaled these bacteria. The purpose? To see how far a real biological attack would spread if it occurred in an urban area. 
Just as expected, the bacteria spread for dozens of kilometers within just hours. But what wasn't expected was people started getting sick. One hospital recorded 11 cases of severe urinary tract infections, one death from blood poisoning. Everything was covered up. No one was notified. No one was apologized to. It wasn't until the 1970s, when classified documents were declassified and Congress began investigating, that the public learned. This was just one of over 200 similar experiments the U.S. government had conducted on civilians, without consent, without notification. Officials declared the bacteria used were safe, but many scientists disputed this. Serratia morsessens could be fatal to people with weak immune systems, like the elderly, children or sick people.